Hey, it's really good to see you guys again uh, here today as we begin a time uh, as we come collectively together to worship Him. Again, we may not be here physically, uh, but we are here in, in, in truth and spirit, and that's what matters. That's all that matters. We could be together, we could be together physically, but not together in unity, and that would be worse. And so, uh, some of us are watching online, some of us are, are, will be coming to the uh, services in the building and things like that, I get that. But regardless if we're in the building, regardless if you're in your living room watching this, uh, in whichever day of the week, we're together in spirit. And let's keep that in mind. Um, let's pray today before we get started that God would be with us, that, that all that we do and say would bring Him glory. And I pray that would be your prayer too. So let's not make it about us, but let's make this about Him and who He is and just exalt His Son, Jesus Christ. So if you would, bow your heads and your hearts, and we're going to have a word of prayer. We'll have some music, and then we're going to spend some time in God's Word. So let's just take a minute and pray. Father, thank you for this awesome day. Thank you that we can collectively come together, and we are together in spirit and truth, regardless of we may not be in the building together or even watching it all online together. But ultimately, we are together because we are your children and we are worshiping you. And we, all that we do and say today, we, it is our desire that it will bring you glory and it will bring you pleasure. So we just pray all this in the most powerful name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, in his name. Amen. Amen. Bowing here, I find my rest And without you, I fall apart And you're the one that guides my heart And Lord, I need you, oh, I need you hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in
In Judges, the last chapter of Judges, Judges 21, uh, the very last verse in Judges, uh, chapter 21, verse 25, that verse reads, In those days, meaning the days of the Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever he wanted. Let me read it to you one more time. And this sums up the era or the era of the judges. Okay? It says again, the last chapter, the very last verse. Chapter 21, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did whatever he wanted. Throughout the book of Judges, that's what we read. We read about these, this, this cycle that they would get into. They would, uh, they would do everything that they, the, that they thought was right uh, from their humanly reasoning or whatever. Whatever they thought was okay, whatever they, however they wanted to live their lives, that's how they did it. And as they did that, God would uh, get very frustrated with them. He would raise up another nation to come in uh, and, and to pretty much set them straight, right? And then after another nation would come in and begin to persecute them, they would cry out to God. They would repent. Uh, God would send them a person to lead them out of it. And then lo and behold, they would go right back into it. And I think it's about seven times in this period, seven times they did this. And they kept falling into it, but the theme of it was they kept doing what they thought was right in their own eyes. Everyone did whatever he wanted. Now, that's really the, the, the humanness that perv that's been pervading for, for since time, right? That's humanness. That's the brokenness of that's what sin causes within our lives right there. That sin just distorts everything. We don't know truth, we don't know what is right, we don't know what is wrong. It just we just uh, in a left in that state, uh, we don't we don't know how to live our lives and we just begin to do whatever we want to do. Now, uh, the question becomes for you and I, we have the word of God to tell us the truth, right? We have the word of God that says this, you know, to look at, to read and understand this revelation, if we could say, say it that way, where God reveals to us, where God gives us his truth. He gives us uh, the, the, um, how, the instruction. He gives us the, um, uh, the, the way of how, of how to live right? Of how to live. There's a right way, there's a wrong way. Now, would you agree with me that in America right now, in America we're struggling with some philosophies that have pervaded over the years and now really taking a toll on us? Okay, let me, let me just read, let me just go over three, three of these, okay? The first one is individualism. And individualism basically says, I got it. I got it. I'll take care of it. I will do it. I'm in control. I am in control of my life. I will determine what is right. I will determine what is wrong. I'm basically my own God. I get it. I understand. I'm going to live for myself. I will determine these things. I will determine what happens within my life, what doesn't happen. I will determine my fate. All these things. I, 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 right? Now, it doesn't take long to realize that this whole individually, individuality or individualism is, is a philosophy, a philosophy that is re wreaking havoc within uh, within the United States. And we see that. We see that happen, right? We see it happen, and it's the same thing that took place back here. This, this individualism that says, I am in control. I'm the one that will determine what is right and what is wrong, okay? And we can certainly live our lives that way. There are some of us that choose to live our lives that way. There are some of us that know that's not the way to do it. There are some of us that are Christ followers but instead of submitting to Him, instead of submitting to His Holy Spirit, we fall in this trap of individualism where we say, I'm in control. I'm the one that's going to determine what is right and wrong, right? I'm going to determine these things, okay? Very destructive philosophy that has pervaded America, that's pervaded the world, whatever, uh, that is pervaded that we see across the landscape of America. The second one is one that we would call secular, secularism, okay? Secularism. Secularism... Uh, it could be summed up. That's, it could be summed up in these, this phrase that says, "God is unnecessary." Okay, God's unnecessary. Uh, we don't need God. You know, uh, you know, we, you know, there's the, you know, there's a God. There may be a God, but the, or not, it doesn't really matter. There could be a God. You know, we won't even argue that point. There could be a God, but he's unnecessary. All right, we don't really need him. And we can kind of see this happening over the past, what, 40, 50, 60 years or whatever. Uh, for instance, we've taken prayer out of school. 
We, we are now stripping, that, stripping away the Ten Commandments and things like that out of courthouses, which reminds us that we do live under a Judeo-Christian uh, value system. Our law is based upon that. And we're stripping those down because we're saying, well, that's not, you know, that, that, that's attributed more towards uh, a God. So we got to strip those down and we, we got we to become more secular. We got to become more. So what we see is we see God being removed from all areas of life, our public life, right? Some, some of it starts with our private lives, right? We remove God from our private lives, remove from our public lives. We remove him from our governments. We remove him from media schools. We remove him from newspapers, from publications. We remove him from all kinds of things. We remove anything that that speaks to, to, to God. Now, we could probably even drill down and say Jesus, Jesus Christ, right? We could probably go that far because right now, that is what we are really up against in a sense. We embrace all these other gods from all these other religions, but when it comes to the God of Christianity, now we've got a problem. Okay, because we've bought in so far into individualism and we've also bought in so much into that bought in. That's not a word, is it? It is today. Bought in. We've bought in. We've bought in, we've bought in to individualism, and we've also bought into secularism. And we see the tenets of it, we see the impact of it in our society now. Very scary. My kids going to school, very scary. Some of the things they come home, some of the things that's just uh, not taught, or the things that are taught, uh, very scary to me. And then the third thing is, and these are just a few philosophies that, that, we, that we are tempted to buy into uh, because uh, we're falling into the same era as, as the judges here, uh, and we just do whatever we want. The third thing is relativism. Now, relativism means this. It means uh, there are no absolutes. There's not an absolute truth. What may be true for me may not be true for you. Okay, uh, this truth over here may apply to this person, but it doesn't apply to me. That's not this universal truth. There are no absolutes. What's true uh, for me may not be true for you, and so forth. Okay, I don't know if you know who Ra Ravi Zacharias is. Ravi Zacharias. Um, uh, is an apologist, someone who uh, we would say defends the faith. And you may have seen his stuff online. Uh, there's other individuals that do the same thing. Lee Strobel would be considered an apologist and some other individuals that kind of defend the faith. They kind of go to bat for the faith or they just are able to, not, and not that it's hostile or anything like that, but they're able to, to defend the truth, kind of look into these these philosophies and show you how they're wrong. Timothy Keller is a great, I think, a great person. Uh, his books, uh, to read the reason for faith, great book to read uh, that deals with skepticism, but deals with these philosophies, some of these philosophies. Okay, but Ravi Zacharias, I digress. Ra Ravi Zacharias, I was watching him one time, and he was he he, he you know, and if you if you're familiar with him, or um, you've seen some of his things, or if not. What he will do, he will go to these different uh, lectures. He will do these different lectures and go to different areas of the country, different schools, different universities, things like that. And people, and he will give people an opportunity to come up to the mic and kind of present their case. And then he will discuss with them in front of all these people, you know, uh, what what they're espousing. So one time, uh, he uh, one of the, one of the episodes I was watching, they were talking about relativism. Now remember, relativism means that uh, you know there the, there's there's not an absolute truth. Okay, uh, there's no absolutes. So what may be true for me may not be true for you. Okay, so so then uh, someone who buys into relativism says, why do we need laws? We're all inherently good people, and that's exactly what happened in one of his one of these uh, one of these lectures he was doing. Some uh, young person comes to the mic and basically presents his case of relativism, and basically says, "You know what? We're we're inherently good people. Humans are inherently good people. Why do we have to have laws? Because what may be true for you is not true for me." And kind of started this whole path of relativism. Ravi listened to him very politely, as he always does. Very professional, always never argumentative whatsoever. None of these guys are argumentative. Timothy Keller, all these guys are not argumentative whatsoever, but they listen and they and they interact and they and they speak uh, in the same language, or they they have this they they dialogue uh, at the, at the level in which the, these people are dialoguing. And so this person goes through this this you know this whole concept, this spiel of relativism and how we're all inherently good people and that we don't need laws and things like that. Um, and Ravi Zacharias, when the guy's done, just stands there for a second and he asks him one question. Do you lock your doors at nighttime? And I just, I thought that was the greatest answer whatsoever. Because the answer is yes, he does. So if everybody's inherently good, 
If there, if no absolutes apply to anybody, if truth is only applies to some and, and not others, and there's no absolutes and things like that, then you know, and, and everybody's inherently good. Then why, why, why would we have to lock our doors at night? And the crowd kind of laughed, and you know, because because he made his point. He made his point that not everybody is operating on the same at the same level, right? And that's the problem. That's the problem. That's exactly what was happening in the days of the judges. There was no king. They didn't believe in a God, right? There was no king. There was no one directing them. There was no one instructing them, right? They did believe in a God. Actually, they prayed to them. But they didn't have any leadership, right, that was leading them in a positive direction. And what happened then, consequently, everyone did whatever he wanted. And that's exactly what's happened in, our, in, in America today. We're buying into all this individualism philosophies, the secularism, secularism philosophy, and relativism, just to name three. There's many other philosophies that people buy into that are, that are wrong, right? The question becomes, what do you buy into? And hopefully you don't dabble into these either. Hopefully you don't dabble a little bit into this and dabble into that. But what is it that you buy into? What is the standard in which you're going to build your life upon? Okay, what is it that guides you? And we've talked, you know, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this sense of, you know, living out the Beatitudes, living out the Sermon on the Mount, building our lives upon that standard, building our lives upon the standard uh, that says, you know, I'm going to, my life is about God. Okay, and I think it comes down to, again, how we view life and how we view ourselves. Okay, and last week we talked a little bit about that. We talked about, you do, do we view ourselves dead or alive, right? If we're dead, dead their old ways, then we, we are alive in Christ and we are, we are living our lives and patterning our lives uh, upon Him and upon the power of His Holy Spirit. Okay, now in Proverbs, this is where it all goes amok. Okay, and if you would want to turn to Proverbs with me very quickly, if you would, if you want to, uh, Proverbs we're going to look at uh, verse twenty or chapter twenty nine, and we're going to look at verse eighteen. And I want you to kind of, I want you to, to listen back here, or, or, or kind of keep in mind what we read from Judges, where everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do in their in their own mind because they didn't have instruction, didn't have leadership. And listen to what Solomon writes uh, in uh, Proverbs twenty nine verse eighteen. He says this: Without revelation, without revelation, people run wild. But one who listens to instruction will be what? Will be happy. Without revelation, people run wild. Without revelation. What is revelation? We keep talking about Well, we got that book in the back of our Bible called Revelations. And that, frankly, that book scares me half to death because I don't understand it. It talks about monsters. It's sci-fi. It's all this stuff. Is it happening now? Did it already happen? Is it going to happen in the future? What's going to happen? What's taking place? Is it really about the end times? It just sounds like, again, a big Hollywood horror movie of the things that's taking place. And I just don't like to read Revelation. Okay? Well, that's kind of, hopefully that you don't feel that way, right? But revelation is something that is revealed to us, something that we may not have seen before, and it's being revealed. And that's what this is about. But, uh, Solomon says, when you don't have something, you know, from God, from, the, the, from God that comes, you know, as we lean into God and God reveals the way, you know, reveals to us how to live. That's what Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount. He revealed. You know, this is what they're, they're telling you. This is what you've heard. But then Jesus reveals the truth. Jesus lays it out. What, you know, he, he gives us the truth. He enables us to see it through the power of the Holy Spirit. He enables us to, uh, by the way, that's what Paul writes in, Col in Corinthians. That people, the people that, that aren't um, uh, Christians, that aren't surrendered to the power of God, they see these things, they hear these things, and they sound like foolishness. Of course they're going to sound like foolishness. Because the kingdom of God seems like an upside-down, inside-out way of living, doesn't it? It goes completely against human logic, human rationale. And when we stay in that concept of individualism, when we stay in that, in that philosophy of secularism and relativism, when we stay in that, we're blinded. We don't see anything else. We're blinded. We only see what we see from human logic, human rationale. We cannot interpret this book from human rationale and human logic. It doesn't make sense because it's God. God doesn't make sense at times, right? In comparison to the world. And that's why many of us will reject that. But if we have his revelation, Paul writes in Corinthians, it says, when we have the Spirit of God, the Spirit is the one who reveals things. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the Spirit of who God, or uh, reveals us the things of God, God's heart, the things of who, who God is. And when we have, the, the only way that can happen is by having the Holy Spirit within our lives to do what? To reveal that to us. And who knows anybody better than that, than the Spirit 
of that person. My spirit knows me more than anyone else, right? Because that's who I am, right? And Paul says, people who don't have the spirit of God looks at this stuff and, and it's foolishness. It doesn't make sense, right? Love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Uh, walk the extra mile for someone. Forgive people. All these things. You know, the things that, that Jesus continually taught. The Sermon on the Mount. All those things. Looks like foolishness to the world because they don't have the revelation. That's what Solomon's saying. Without revelation, what's going to happen? People are going to run wild. It's going to happen. I mean, why would we ever be surprised about it? Why would we be surprised when we see these things happening in our world? They're happening because people aren't choosing to use this to, as their standard of living. Now, here's the thing, guys. Do you truly know who you are? Do you truly know that you're a child of God if you've received His free gift of grace and salvation? Do you truly understand that? I want you to look at Psalm 139, uh, just a couple of verses here in Psalm 139. I absolutely love this because, I, because it really takes us back to who we are. Not by the way we think we are or the way we interpret it, by, but being revealed to us. What does the Word of God have to say about us? Listen to what, listen to what this, or, or I'm sorry, Psalm 139, I don't know if I said 140, but Psalm 139, verse 13. For it was you, meaning God, it was you who, this is David uh, writing in his, uh, writing uh, uh, this psalm in his journal or whatever, and he's writing it to God and he's saying, it was you, God, for it was you who created my inward parts. You created me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in, the, in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. You see, I think that takes us back to who we truly are. We're truly created by God. We're truly created by God. We have purpose. We have meaning. And if that's the case, if I truly believe that, if I truly believe that, that I've been created by God, that God knew me before I was even formed, that God knew me in my mother's womb, God knew me in the secret when I was formed in the depths of the earth, uh, before I was, you know, even before I was even formed, you saw me when I was formless, right? That, if I truly believe that, then that means my life is, is, it has meaning and has purpose, or should have meaning and have purpose, right? And so what I want to do today is I want to, again, I want us to examine what it is that we're building our life upon, the values, that were standards that we're building our life upon. How, what do, is it that you truly believe? Do you truly believe that your life is precious? Do you truly believe that your life was created to have purpose and meaning? Do you truly believe before you even was brought into existence on this earth, God had you in mind? Do you truly believe that? And if you do truly believe that, how can you buy into individualism, secular, secularism, or relativism, or any other ism, any other philosophy? Because they're all wrong. They're all wrong. They're all false. It's all deceit. It's all counterfeit. It's all deception. Because those things do not bring life. They bring destruction. Those thoughts and patterns bring, bring destruction. Now, I don't have to go into a lot of statistics and facts and start talking about all the abortions that happens in America, all these other horrific things, these mur murders, crimes, all this other stuff, horrible, horrible things that happen. I don't have to go in that to prove the point. I think we all see it. Spend a few minutes watching the news, and I think you'll see it. Spend a few minutes on social media, and you're going to see it. You're going to see humanness at its most wickedness, I think, right? But how do you view it? Do you believe that you have purpose? Turn with me one last time, if you would, uh, to Ephesians. And I think, you know, this is where I, wanna, I, I want you to understand and just build your life upon the standards that God has for you because you are wonderfully and uh, remarkably made. And in Ephesians chapter 2, he says in verse 8, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He says this, For you are saved by grace through faith. Nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. The only thing that you can do is receive. Okay? For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. This is not from yourselves. 
it is, it is God's gift. Not from works so that you can boast, so that no one can boast. And then he says this, For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus, for what? For good works, which God prepared ahead of time, so that we should walk in them. One more time. For we are his creation. We are his creation. He created us. He knew us before we was ever formed. He knew you. He knew every single one of us before we were ever formed. And he's had intent for you from the very beginning. He's had a purpose for you from the very beginning. What is that purpose? Good works. That purpose is to save you. That purpose is to, is to offer you grace, this free gift of grace and salvation. Nothing you could ever do on your own. There's nothing you could ever do on your own. It's by His grace. All you have to do is receive. And with that, you were created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that what? So that you should walk in them. So what does that mean, good works? Well, what that means is this. Every single one of us has been created with a, an incredible amount of gifts that God has given us, okay? And they're not gifts for, just for your pleasure, okay? They're gifts that, that are given to us to do what? To bring Him glory. Guys, we've got to start, first of all, by understanding this isn't, I can't do this on my own. It's not about being in this individualistic spirit. It's not about being rugged. It's not about, you know, I can do this. I just got to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can, you know, just, I can suck it up. I can just make it happen. Guess what? You can't make it happen. It's only by the power of His Holy Spirit. And when I build my life upon His standards, when I understand that God has revealed, you know, God has revealed to us Jesus Christ Himself, Jesus Christ, an extension of, him, of who He is, a part of who He is, He has revealed Him to us. He's revealed Him to us through His Word. When I begin to see that and I begin to understand my life is precious, my life has purpose and meaning, I begin to understand then, like what Paul is saying, that that, that God created me for something. God created me to bring Him glory. God created me so that, so that I would embrace and build my life upon the standards of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, so that my heart would be tender. My heart would be sensitive towards other people. I would be sensitive towards God. I would realize this isn't about me. It's about Him. I would realize that, you know, that, that I'm not going to be someone that talks in half-truths or a technical person that, that, that speaks in technicalities, but all along I'm you know, giving false impressions and things like that. that, that that's not me. That's not who I am. He reveals to me that's not who I am. But instead, I'm someone that he loves so deeply, someone that he wants to just, just save from the inside and out, that he wants to just change from the inside out, that he wants to bring life to, that he wants to bring joy, happiness, peace, all of these things too. But it's not based upon what the world says. It's based upon what he reveals to us through his word and through who he is and how he's created us. I am specially created. You are specially created in his image. And again, that's not, it's for, it's for him to be brought glory. It's for us to bring him glory. We've got to remember it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about Him. It's not about us. It's about us from the sense that we're the recipients of His love and grace and mercy. It's about us that we are recipients of His salvation. It's about us as we bring Him glory, as we, as we sing back our worship and praises to Him, as we spend time reflecting in His Word, and we, and, and we, and we submit to the power of His Holy Spirit. Yes, that's about us. But He's the originator of all things. If it wasn't for Him, we would have nothing. If it wasn't for Him, we would have absolutely nothing. He has created us. He has created us, you, in a very special way. Every single one of us, every single person has a gift, at least one gift. And I'm telling you, I've, I've never met anyone that just has one gift. I haven't. God blesses us just so much lavishly, as Paul uses that word in Ephesians, Paul blesses us lavishly for what? To bring him glory. And it spills all over us and we're blessed. But it begins by what we build our life on. What are the standards? And again, it's not a half in, half out. It's not straddling that fence. But it's understanding who I am in Christ. It's understanding that I've been wonderfully and remarkably made. It's understanding that I have gifts. And when I get myself lined up with Him, when I get myself lined up with Him, then that horizontal aspect can take place and my gifts can be demonstrated throughout this world, bringing Him 
glory. That's the purpose of my life. That's the purpose of your life if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope that you're building your life upon the right standards. I get that we can give it lip service. I get that some of us give it a little bit more lip service than other people. I get that. But it doesn't come down to lip service. It comes down by embracing who Jesus is. Embracing the fact, the, the truth that I was created in His image and that He's restored me to His image and that now I exist to bring Him glory. What do you believe about your life? What do you believe about your life? Are you just kind of running all willy and nilly, right, without any revelation? Or do you have a revelation, the truth, that God loves you and that God created you with these gifts and He wants, them to, he wants you to use them to bring Him glory? And when we do that, that's when all these blessings begin to spill on us. It's just, it's just the way God works. I hope and pray, as always, that you are a person that spends time in the Word um, allowing God to reveal Himself more and more and more through His Word, through the power of His Holy Spirit, through prayer, through all these, th these other mechanisms that God has given us to, so that we can draw closer to Him. I hope that that's what you live, and I hope that you understand how wonderfully and, cre and remarkably you're made and the gifts that He has given you and what those gifts are to be used for. I hope you have a great week. I hope you just, uh, again, will really, uh, a red flag will go up if you're buying into some things, the, the philosophies of the world, because they are very destructive. They're very destructive, and they're going to take away from who God is. That's what they're designed to do. But instead, I hope that you're not that type of person, but instead you're leaning hard into God and leaning on His Holy Spirit and allowing His Holy Spirit to change you. I hope you have a great week, and I hope you spend time uh, in the Word of God. Spend some time reading uh, in, the, in the Proverbs and, and Psalms. Read, read Psalm 139 again. Spend some time reflecting on, on that this week and understanding how wonderful you're, wonderfully you're made. Spend some time in Ephesians chapter 2 understanding that, that we were saved by grace to bring Him glory, and that God has gift, given us gifts uh, and given us a purpose here. I hope that's what you do this week. Hope you have a great week. Let me close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much that we could spend time together. Help us not to forget what we've heard. Help us not to just allow it to go in one ear and out the other either, but instead help us to take it, retain it, embrace it, and allow it to, to uh, grow and produce fruit within our lives. We thank you, we love you, and we pray that all that we did and say would bring you glory. And may we bring you glory this week as we go out into our world, and may we break down the walls of these isms that we talked about and allow you to shine through us and reveal to other people that they are so much loved by you and that you have an incredible purpose for them. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.